Well, thank you so much, Hans Ulrich, for the introduction, and thanks for having me. When I was invited, I, I told myself, well, it's going to be so great being in a room full of people who haven't even been born in 1989, <laughs> because I can talk about 1989, and no one is going to be able to contradict me. <laughs> so this is essentially what I'm planning to do. <laughs> You, can, you have the choice whether you want to believe me or not. But what I would like to do is to compare these two historical moments in time, 1989 and 2013. In 1989, people saw that the Apple logo memorializes Alan Turing, the mathematician and scientist who led the foundations for computer science with his pioneering research. Turing committed suicide in 1954 by biting an apple laced with cyanide, an act many people attributed to his being massively persecuted for being gay. In 2013, people thought Turing's suicide was a reenactment of a scene in Walt Disney's animation film Snow White. A while ago, I saw a remarkable barricade. Actually, this was in Istanbul. During a riot, people dug up cobblestones and threw urban furniture onto a makeshift pile. And of course, this type of construction is not new at all, but the movement of people around this barricade was completely stunning because first, protesters pretended to defend it against police, which was attacking using tear gas and rubber bullets, and then the police conquered the barricade and started defending it, but into the other direction. Then the police abandoned the barricade, and the protesters retook the position and started defending it into yet another direction. So the whole thing seemed to have like five fronts locked into one another, some of them facing inwards. Um, and all of them were fully mobile and ready to be flipped around at any point in time. This construction reminded me of a work by Yoko Ono, which was recently described by Brian Cohen Wood, a chess game with two full sets of white figures. The opponent is unclear and unknown and also likely to be yourself. And this is a far cry from the situation in 1989 when clear fronts and physical walls seemed to split the world in two antagonistic parts. And things were either black or white. They were offline or online. They were off-screen or on-screen. They were east or west. In 1989, the most powerful border in Europe was a war. In 2013, the most powerful border in Europe is water. And the flow of water is not restricted to any specific location, but instead it is channeled through any building's wall, to, through its pipes, through its plumbings, through anyone's flat screens and tablets, and also bodies eventually surging to drown people, to flood coastline, or to gush from your eyes because of heartbreak or tear gas. Also, the water might freeze over, and then you can rebuild the wall in the exact place where it used to be. This is President Obama's most recent speech at the Brandenburg Gate, <laughs> talking about breaking the walls in our hearts behind a transparent barricade of bulletproof ice. In this situation, a chess game might look more than this or this, or this, which is a fantastic work by Meta Haven called Nomadic Chess, about how chess is updated in the age of fractal design and asymmetric warfare, and one can even 
wear it. Before 1989, people imagined they were cameras. In 2013, people imagined they are half safe for work HSFW JPEGs. In 1989, people started walking through walls, but images also started walking through screens and became things, people. They became blobicist architecture, subsidized investment ruins, or post-internet investment portfolios. So-called physical reality is now littered by post-digital objects, like this pixelated bikini, Images incarnate as riots, as products, as lens flares, as high-rises, or holographic sculptures <laughs> sponsored by arms manufacturers. So this is what happens to images. They came off screen in the past two and a half decades. But what happened to all the people who were walking through walls in 89? Where were they headed? anyways. People assumed they were walking towards freedom, but this was plain wrong. In fact, they were walking towards the internet. This is an advertisement uh, by, for Windows software. It's called uh, Breaking Down Walls in Customers' Lives, and the tagline is Life Without Walls, and one had to break a concrete envelope with a hammer and win a trip to the remnants of the Berlin Wall. But even if people were headed towards the Internet, it didn't mean they all got there or that those who got there managed to stay in there to be more precise, they started walking or even running towards a condition where borders were defined by a very simple rule. Outside, one could see the military on the surface, and the internet was kind of hidden below, whereas inside, the internet was on the surface, and the military was its underlying infrastructure. Inside, one would see a set of online stores and tumblers that replaced 3D organizations like bookstores or public parks or hospitals. <laughs> Whereas outside, there was a mix of segregation walls, surgical strikes and call centers. Before 1989, Salvador Allende's administration imagined a cybernetic, socialist version of the Internet, and Star Trek ripped its look from Allende's dead coup cool control room. Before 2013, Keith Alexander, head of the National Security Agency, ripped Star Trek's control room for his NSA Information Dominance Center. So what happened is that the borders between in and outside started folding, so to speak, into the Internet, frustrating its ideology of free access and circulation and consumerism and permanent twerking. The situation became more like a sponge in which a multiplicity of folded-in borders were enclosing and undermining pockets of internet liquidity, promising oceanic feelings and never-ending GIF loops. In, oops, in 1989, the world was shown as a map. In 2013, the world is shown as a 3D model. This is a 3D animation for a gated shopping mall in India. There is a security perimeter with checkpoints ready to be defended by armed guards, and inside there are render ghosts, fake fountains, and ripped brand shops. 
The whole thing is made of inflated polygons and tortured plastic, entirely rendered, surveilled and maintained via offshore coal centers, <laughs> while every single one of these branch shops is in fact personally managed by Joseph Stalin. And previously, Stalin's brand stores were all pop-up galleries providing a slightly radioactive glow to CGI realty. Every external perimeter fence borders a new mall and some malls start folding into other ones so that NATO barbed wire and checkpoints start cutting across lines, lanes within supermarkets. The map of the world might also look like this. This is a hand-drawn map of the Westgate shopping mall during its siege. In 1989, the term fourth generation warfare is coined by a number of US analysts to refer to conflicts characterized by a blurring of the lines between war and politics, soldier and civilian, internet reality and physical reality. In 2013, people watch World War IV, showing CGI zombies breaking through the apartheid wall, trying to chew off Brad Pitt's brains. In 2013, people suddenly find themselves at the other end of the internet condition, being ejected from it by violence, by mistake or choice, or simply by the fact that suddenly a pop-up wall appears right inside your living room, which is in fact also a studio slash sweatshop slash outsourced vendor farm for a private military contractor. People find themselves stranded in local situations increasingly defined by massive inequality, hunger, subsistence struggle around land and resources, overbearing surveillance, foreclosed Wi-Fi and all sorts of homegrown fascists. So instead of breaking out, for many it is about figuring out how to break back in. But break back into what and how. In 1989, people broke through the Berlin Wall. In 2013, an internet user has admitted hacking a service provider's computers, threatening to burn down its offices and menacing its owner with an axe. So you see, this person knows that in order to break back into the internet, one has to go about it both off and online, because this is where the internet lives nowadays. One has to physically hack not only into the servers, but also into the provider's doors. And nowadays, many people have also started treating the web as a zone of major contamination, wearing protective gear, all sorts of anonymizing devices, precaution, leaving just a facade of small talk for the corporate web, instead evacuating into strategic withdrawal, camouflage and subterfuge. Around 1989, people trashed Secret Service's headquarters and their archives. In 2013, people didn't do this. <laughs> September 5th, 2013, Hürriyet Daily News. The Turkish hacker group Red Hack announced today via Twitter that it had hacked the website of the Turkish police, leading to a temporary halt at all entrances and exits through the country's borders. International entrances and exits, which halted at around 1 p.m., was back to normal at around 5.10 p.m. The group said they hacked the website in protest at police violence during Gezi protests. 
1990, it turned out that the number of those people who actually stormed the archives of the Secret Service in Berlin, the Stasi, were actually members of the Stasi who managed to destroy a number of files potentially containing evidence <laughs> against them. This is a picture that was not destroyed and that shows a Stasi member kneeling down to receive an unknown award. This is the award. In 2013, after many requests from potential customers to download a full backup of their data, the NSA decided to offer commercial premium memberships which included upload options to personal NSA files and mobile cloud services. <laughs> I have this guy. He was, uh, he was um, 33 in 1989. In 2013, he is 27, and he tells me, oh, mom, why don't you just shut up? I finally found a gallery to show my styrofoam post-internet sculptures. After 1989, people crossed the border from Turkey to Greece. After 2013, people will start crossing the border from Greece to Turkey to continue building alternate internets like the one on Athens rooftops, but also like others in Spain, South Africa, or rural communities worldwide. In 1989, people thought that the Apple logo memorializes Alan Turing, the mathematician and scientist who led the Foundation for Computer Science. Turing committed suicide in 1954 by biting an apple laced with cyanide, an act many people attributed to his being massively persecuted for being gay. In 2013, thousands of people rushed to emergency rooms as they inexplicably started choking after biting off too big a chunk of their apple. Thank you.